Hello, everyone, and thanks for being here. My name is Rob, and I'm an engineer on the developer relations team. Hello, and I'm Ron, and I'm also an engineer on the Android dev developer relations team. Yep. The same team? The same team. Oh, thanks. I missed that. OK, should we get started? Please say yes. 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 Perfect. OK, so we used to live in a world where one screen would mean a single activity being displayed, right? Yeah, that's no longer the case. There are two ways in which this can happen. So your users have much more powerful devices in their pocket, and they're actually much bigger than they used to be. So it's perfectly fine for them to use multiple apps at the same time. You cannot really opt out of that, and we call it multi-window. On the other hand, as a developer, you can actually opt in to a specific feature that will allow you to show two activities side by side. And we call it activity embedding. Let's start with multi-window. With multi-window, you can do two things at the same time, either from the same app or from different apps. Of course, this means that some things have to change. For example, well, multiple activities being resumed at the same time. But let's, step, let's take a step back. There have been important changes across versions of Android, one of which is the change in lifecycle management for multi-window. While before Android 10, only the focused activity was resumed, with Android 10 and newer, all the activities currently on screen are resumed. And the last one the user interacted with is notified with a flag. Let's see that in detail. Up until Android 9, you would acquire resources during the started phase, update the UI during the resume step, and finally release the acquired resources and stop UI updates in the stopped phase. With Android 10, things change a little bit. You do the same things in the started and resumed phase and stop UI updates in the stopped phase. But there is something new. On top resumed activity changed will tell you via a flag if yours is the topmost activity which is the one the user the most recently interacted with. So let's see that in code. On top resumed activity changed is a method in your activity that you can override, and this flag will tell you if you are the topmost activity. If you are the topmost activity, you will attempt to acquire new resources, and if you're not, you should actually release your resources, because that means that the user is not interacting with your app anymore. Oh, I lost the beast. Well, talking about this, we need to mention exclusive resource access. Well, we should add an audio effect here, like an something said. Effect, like something like, da, 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 da. <laughs> yes, that. <laughs> so, that set the mood right. <laughs> Perfect. OK, what are exclusive resources? Well are all the resources that can be accessed by only one app at the given time, like microphone or camera. Why is that? Well, each app can request a different bitrate or resolution, for instance, or totally different features like video and still imagery. If you're thinking about a way to get around these limitations, we have bad news. Remember that settings your activity as not resizable will not grant you exclusive access, as Android 12L and newer can force any app to be multi-window. Moreover, as we saw before the break, camera preview will freeze if not done properly and will not resolve on focusing back. Or even worse, your app will crash. Next up, the big elephant in the room. Configuration changes. I mean, we really try to avoid this, but you all saw that coming, right? So when multi-window is initialized, activities are notified of one configuration change, because of course, the size of the window is changing. But it often triggers multiple configuration changes, because orientation, size, position on the screen can all change. The default behavior when configuration changes occur on Android is to kill the activity and restart it, with more often than not, a loss of state be it window content, scroll position, long operation stopping unexpectedly, 
or wrong position in the navigation hierarchy, all of these will mean a bad experience for your users. <clears throat> there are basically two ways you can avoid losing your state. The first way is to let the system handle the activity destruction and recreation, leveraging on savings and state, view models, or remember savables. And the other is handling a specific set of configuration changes in your code. Let's see how. Well, first, in your Android manifest file, you need to add the config change line in your activity tag, listing all the, the configurations that you want to manage. Then, in your activity, you override the on configuration changed method and run your layout uh, calculation and invalidation in there. And now, I would like to invite Ran to tell us something more about activity embedding. Yeah. Thanks, you, Rob. So, We've seen how a user can run two apps at the same time, where each app has one activity being displayed. Now, I want to talk to you about a different scenario, where we as developers, we want to show more than one app, one, more than one activity, two activities in our app. And this is where activity embedding really uh, is really useful. Activity embedding allows you to display two activities side by side, which is great if you want to implement list detail layout with minimum or even zero code refactoring. Activity embedding will automatically choose the right presentation based on the available screen size and the configuration that you provide. That means that you don't need to branch your code to handle small and large screens. In other words, there is no is tablet Boolean, so forget about that. All right, here's an example of a great, amazing application that we've worked. Uh, it has one activity that just shows a list of fruits, and when the user clicks on the fruit, it launches another activity that shows the lorem ipsum details of that fruit. I know it's super complicated. This is how it runs on a Pixel 7. Now, if I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to launch the same app with the same activities on a tablet, suddenly there's enough room to display both activities, and activity embedding will automatically choose the right presentation layer and will show them side by side. But now the cool thing. The library also supports configuration changes on runtime. That means that if the user resize my, my application, activity embedding, the library will automatically switch between showing one activity or two activities side by side. Yeah, I hear that. OK. So let's take a look at how it works. Activity embedding doesn't change the fundamental way that activity ordering on Android works. OK? Under the hood, it creates two containers, or activity stacks, if you will, primary and secondary. The secondary one is always considered to be above or on top of the primary one. That means that if there is enough room, we're going to display two containers side by side. But if there is room to display only one container, the one on top will be displayed. And this is how we keep the same ordering the way we used to have since Android, I don't know, one. Here's an example. Let's say we have an app with a, a list activity on the left and a details activity on the right. Okay? Let's assume that the user clicks on something on the details activity, the one on the right, which launches a sub-detail activity, another activity. And as you can see, when a new activity is being launched, it is automatically bound to the container that it was launched from. Let's take a look at another scenario. In this, in this uh, example, we have two activities, A and B, and for some reason, we decided to give activity B more room. Because it's a foldable device, there's more room, we can display more information, makes perfect sense. However, the library also supports physical changes of the screen. So if the user suddenly folds the device, suddenly we have a different screen, physical screen. The external screen of a foldable device is usually way smaller than the internal one, right? What will happen is that activity embedding will resize and reposition the container, resulting with the same ordering that we expect, that the user expects, automatically. We don't need to change anything in our code to support that. And a similar thing happens when the user will reopen their, uh, their foldable. Um, and the secondary container will be expanded, and both containers will be displayed side by side. Let's take a look at the code. This is basically the heart of activity embedding, a configuration file in XML. First, I'm going to define how do I want to split the screen. 
The default is 50-50, and in this case, I decided to go with 30-70, which sometimes works better on tablets. I also defined the minimum width to trigger a split, 600 dp. I chose this because this is the threshold to move from compact screen size to medium one. We also define that when all activities on one container are being dismissed, the activities on the other containers will be dismissed as well. This means that if the user navigates back on all activities in one container, the other one will be, the activities on the other container will be finished as well. And we define a split filter, which basically tells the system that, hey, if I'm gonna launch the detail activity from the list activity, it will trigger a split. Now, we need to inform the library about those rules and we should do that before any other component of the application loads. So that these rules can be applied to any activity that before it, it is started. And we can use Jetpack Appstart library to do so. So we're basically gonna tell in Android manifest, hey, we're gonna use the Appstart library, and this is gonna be my split initializer class, and we want to implement that class. It's literally those two lines of code calling the split controller, initialize it with the XML file that we provided. The last thing we need to do is add the following lines to both activities, list and detail. That's not a mistake. All the lines that I needed to change in my activities are being displayed right here. That means that I had to change zero lines of code and my refactoring is done. That was the best code refactor in my life. Thank you. So, Embedding activities from your own app is great and super helpful if you want to design for large screen. But that's not all. Starting with Android 13, you can embed activities from other apps as well. Yeah, I hear that. All right, cross-application activity embedding um, allows a tight visual integration between activities that belong to different apps. This allows the host application to provide um, um, an immersive experience to the user. Here's a real world example. Let's take a look at the wallpaper selector that is being, um, that shows up. Sorry. All right, let's take a look at the wallpaper selector that shows up um, in settings. The activity on the left belongs to the embedding host. Basically, it comes from the settings up. The activity on the right belongs to a completely different application, which is the wallpaper app. Another scenario is where we as developers, we want to allow the user to perform a specific focused task on another app without leaving the visual context of our own app. Um, think about if you have uh, a file browser application and you want to allow file preview or a chat application and you want to allow the user to watch a video link or URL preview without leaving the context, the visual context of your chat. Now, Allowing another application to embed your own activity gives a lot of power to that other application. This is why this is an opt-in feature, meaning that you need to tell Android OS that, hey, I want to allow this, activi this activity to be embedded in other apps. And there are basically two trust models that you can do that. If there is a tight integration between two or more apps, you can actually uh, specify the SHA-1 certificate of the apps that you want to allow embedding your activities. But some case, in some cases, um, you don't know what the SHA-1 certificate will be. Maybe your activity is designed to be uh, used by multiple apps. Maybe that SHA-1 certificate uh, will change after you publish your app or whatever. So you can decide to go with an untrusted model. Basically, you're allowing any application to embed your activity. And you do that with adding simple line to your uh, activity entry in the manifest. So if you want to go with a trust model, you can use the known activity embedding search. You can define simple string or an array of certificates. And if you want to allow any apps uh, to embed your activity, you can go with the allow untrusted activity embedding, which is a pretty self-explanatory flag, I guess. All right. Um, if you want to learn more, please go ahead to developer.android.com where you can learn how to uh, make your app multi-window compatible and how to implement activity embedding. I also encourage you uh, to take a look at the source code of the amazing fruit app that we've shown here today. 
Thank you. And we hope you're going to have a fruitful day today. <laughs> with Andrew.